when I was in high school, I was a senior. I made the wrong choices, and um, I was kind of looking for the easy way out. Started selling drugs. Um, did that for a few years. I was a very angry person throughout my teens and 20s and experimented a lot and probably like should have gotten in trouble a lot more times than I actually did. I was doing what everybody else was doing basically. You know what I mean? The, when I was growing up, the cool guys was the, the people that had money, that the people that sold drugs. So, you know, that, that's, that's what I saw since I was a little kid and that's what I wanted to do. My bad decisions caught up to me and I was in a conflict and uh, so my crime, full disclosure, is arson. I ended up going to jail for losing my temper and uh, I ended up putting my hands on somebody. And yeah, I, di I didn't do too much time, but still that was enough time for me to realize that's not what I wanted to do. I was sentenced to 20 years, three and a half to serve, 16 and a half suspended, and 16 and a half years on probation. Um, and so the stakes were high. I would never want my kid to to do anything that I did, you know what I mean? That's not, that wasn't ideal. I was taken away from my child for a while and now I, like when you come back, you feel the sense of duty, like you have to turn your life around and have all the answers, which I do not have. Um, but I figured it out um, and I realized that I don't have to be defined by my past. The United States Constitution's 13th Amendment abolished slavery in 1865 except as a punishment for crime. This created a loophole in the Constitution that has perpetuated a system of slavery in prison to the present day. The justice system embodies the U.S.'s history of racial oppression, with black people comprising only 13% of the United States population, but 37% of the prison population. And so here's this system that's already in place. Police were originally slave patrols. Who were they still patrolling? Still the same people. Predominantly black and brown communities are both over-policed when it comes to social control and surveillance, while being under-policed when it comes to emergency services. So what I see is that we're still working against this big system that's working perfectly. It's designed to incarcerate black and brown people. Right? Disproportionately. Black men in America are incarcerated at a rate six times greater than white men. Currently, one in three black men living in the United States enters the prison system in their lifetime. You just a number, you just a dollar sign, right. and you just want you to come back and forth. Yep. So they throw these brothers out, and they put them with these um, parole officers, mm -hmm. and they put them back in the same neighborhood that they fell into the situation. Mm -hmm. They only know they're going to come back. One outcome of the oppressive design of the prison system is the cycle of recidivism. Recidivism is the pattern of formerly incarcerated people re-offending shortly after release, due in large part to a lack of fundamental supports. Without pathways to re-enter society, people are likely to return to their former patterns. This vicious cycle has resulted in the high recidivism rates in the United States, with 77% of returning citizens re-incarcerating within five years. A lot of people come out of incarceration situations and they're relegated to working low-paying jobs and that drives recidivism rates. All right, once you get a felony, all of a sudden, you, they really got you. Now you can't get an apartment. Now you can't, you can't buy a house. You can't, there's all kinds of stuff that you are, that you are separated from. So a lot of times us being away from the world, we don't know how to manage to get back in the world. Yes. So I might not know, I might be 33 years old, but I'm stuck in a 20 years old mom. Yes. That's when they took me. Yes. So I'm gonna need time, I'm gonna need tools to learn how to value a relationship, what clues to look into a relationship, mm -hmm. and how to invest in a relationship. When incarcerated people re-enter society, they face prejudice along with legal hurdles such as restricted voting rights, limited access to education, job opportunities, social benefits, and public housing. These challenges make it difficult for them to remain out of the prison system. Why am I here? Is because we're, our pe we're, we're, you know, we're helping our people, preparing our people 
to how to navigate white supremacy, right? Because prison, incarceration are all tools of that, right? So this being a predominantly black and brown culture is the start of all the healing and the start of people being able to understand each other and be able to, to help each other in this process. Right, there's this there's this there's this phrase, right, that you can't you can't destroy the master's house with the master's tools. Does those discussions around the inequities within neighborhoods of color directly link to environmental justice and effects of climate change that we see within our communities? Criminal justice and environmental justice are historically intertwined as zoning policies mandated certain neighborhoods for certain people and opened up development projects for polluters throughout the 20th century. Thus, Communities of color are disproportionately victimized by environmental hazards and are far more likely to live in areas facing heavy pollution. We're, we're really in, in crisis, <laughs> like we're in a climate crisis and people are not aware of that. And that, that information is kept from people, especially in neighborhoods that I come from who are like the most heavily polluted. They don't know that they're sucking down toxins all day long, but they're wondering why their whole family is sick and they can't get good health care and all of these problems are interconnected. So I absolutely encourage people to learn more about environment and environmental programs. You're asking people to advocate for things that they can't see um, a lot of the time, which is really is really difficult. So like we might have like a nice hot summer this year, but the summers will begin to get unbearable as the years to come. These same overlooked and underserved communities that face the worst effects of our changing climate are also disproportionately affected by incarceration. They need to be, you know, protected from the environment. A heat island effect, it kills. It kills people in the communities of color in a disproportionate manner, and that is, you know, that's documented. Heat islands are urbanized areas that experience higher average temperatures than suburban areas. The abundance of buildings and asphalt absorbs the city's heat instead of reflecting it a problem worsened by increased urbanization and lack of green canopy cover. Low-income communities of color are disproportionately impacted by the heat island effect. And when these environmental issues are raised, these communities are not always involved in the solution. Greenwashing is essentially a form of green gentrification, which is a better word for it. And green gentrification is essentially the erecting of like energy efficient models, solar panels, any sort of like green infrastructure without giving formal education to the community about what they're seeing and how it affects them. Because the discussion of environmental justice and climate resilience, I mean, it really starts at racial injustice. I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, I honestly got into the program because I just wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something positive. I, uh, Side of being the problem in the community is trying to become the solution. So. Reentry programs are meant to provide a transitional period between prison release and reintegration into society. With access to mental health support, direct aid, and job training programs, previously incarcerated individuals are significantly less likely to recidivate. Reentry programs combat institutional racism and white supremacy, interrupting the cycle of the prison system. Throughout New England, there are organizations and programs that help people who face barriers to employment. Such initiatives combine sustainability and environmental stewardship with job creation and other social services. Groundwork Rhode Island is a nonprofit, community based organization that works in urban areas to promote environmental improvement and create economic opportunities. They focus on building healthier, more resilient, and more equitable urban communities in Rhode Island. My name is Stephanie Moniz. I have like dual roles um, for groundwork. I'm the training and education program coordinator. So I'm like the workforce development arm of groundwork. And I have been a longtime board member of Garden Time. Um, and I started my relationship with Garden Time actually on the inside. I'm also formerly incarcerated. Garden Time is a nonprofit organization based in Providence that is committed to supporting the underserved communities and justice involved individuals of Rhode Island. So, Garden Time, we're a nonprofit um, and we work at the Rhode Island um, adult correctional institutions, um, gardening with incarcerated men and women. And then we also um, train Rhode Islanders for jobs in the green industry once they get out of prison. The Compost Cooperative, located in Greenfield, Massachusetts, 
works to support the community, including previously incarcerated individuals seeking employment. The Compost Cooperative is a for-profit business that collects food scraps, uh, commercial, residential, municipal, and institutional food scraps in Greenfield and surrounding towns um, as a way of diverting food waste from the waste stream and also building uh, cooperatively owned jobs for people who face barriers to employment, such as people who've experienced incarceration. Greenfield Community College's Workforce Development Program begins the reentry process even before release to better prepare inmates for reintegration. We also do training directly at Franklin County Sheriff's Office at the jail and um, are there doing training for individuals who are still incarcerated, but they're earning credentials so that when they get out, they've got some skills to find a job. I mean, that that is the key to not reoffending, right? To being able to have employment and money to support yourself and your family. Some programs like AISS in Springfield offer various services ranging anywhere from mental health to employment support. AISS stands for All Inclusive Support Services. We serve, basically all inclusive means we serve anyone that walks in through our doors, whether you are just as involved or not. The Massachusetts Clean Energy Center is an economic development agency based in Boston, Massachusetts that funds climate solution innovation. The Mass CEC is dedicated to meeting Massachusetts emission reduction goals and the growing energy economy. Mass CEC Workforce Development Team is committed to increasing the accessibility and quality of career awareness and training programs for clean energy and climate tech occupations. We not only hope that these programs provide inclusive opportunities for individuals across all of the Commonwealth, but we also work to promote stronger collaboration and system level coordination to accelerate positive outcomes. The Urban Resources Initiative in New Haven, Connecticut is a Baltimore-based nonprofit organization founded in 1989. URI has found a new home within Yale University and is dedicated to the management and health of natural areas and green spaces within large cities and other urban environments. URI started um, as kind of a volunteer program. People wanted to help out in the community and that started primarily focusing on green spaces. So people finding spaces that were being unused and they wanted to turn them into greener spaces where people can enjoy being. The Arborist Apprenticeship Program is one of multiple vocational training programs within the Hamden County Sheriff's Office. These programs are known for both greatly lowering recidivism rates, as well as sufficiently supporting re-entering citizens on their journeys during and after incarceration. My name is Ben Belisle. I work for the Hamden County Sheriff's Department. I run the Arborist Apprenticeship Program. It is a job readiness program where we take low security residents that are about to um, enter the community and try to get them job ready in uh, skills in the arbor industry. Emerge, a nonprofit social enterprise based in Connecticut, assists the employment process for individuals with criminal records facing employment barriers and is a partner of the Urban Resources Initiative. So Emerge started uh, in 2011, well, it was piloted in 2009 and uh, incorporated in 2011 in response to the recession at the time and the highest incarceration uh, rates in Connecticut history. Um, and during that time, people who had criminal records uh, had a really hard time getting a job. It was hard enough to get a job with a college degree at that time. Uh, so if you had a record, it was impossible. So the typical sort of rapid attachment to the workforce kind of models where you just get a job developer, place people in jobs, that wasn't working. Um, so what our predecessor, Dan Husino, the founding executive director, um, decided to do was, if you're not going to hire these guys, we're going to start our own company and we're going to hire them. Um, so they, they picked an industry that was friendly to uh, people with records, which is construction, landscaping, property maintenance, uh, where there were a lot of job opportunities and just started our own company. 
The Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation in Boston was founded in 1981 with the mission to develop affordable housing and aid the fight for racial and economic justice. Today, they are working towards the expansion of green infrastructure in the city's underfunded neighborhoods. We will always be a housing first organization because if we don't have affordable housing um, at the different spec, you know, scales, whether it's home ownership, Common Square has done that, um, or rentals, if we don't have that, then we don't have a community. You know, it, it, we 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 go beyond that. We recognize that it we that people need uh, opportunities. They need their health. They need access to food. They need to be, um, you know, protected from the environment. All of these organizations face their own struggles, but also have unique qualities allowing them to give back to their communities. Their work is driven by a passion for addressing the needs of those who have suffered under oppressive systems and structures. Well, we really wanted to create a business that was not hierarchical as traditional businesses are, where there's the boss or the, or the investors, the owners, and they get all the money and then the people at the bottom doing all the work and getting minimum wage. We wanted to try something different that, that was non-hierarchical. Reentry starts on day one. Mm. It's important, like a lot of the clients that we have here are not just because of word of mouth, we are building that relationship from the moment they are incarcerated. We have members here and our staff here that go in there and they're in your face almost like, basically I'm from AISS, these are their services, what services do you need when you get out? We want to make sure that we are building a program that leads to a pathway for someone to get to sustaining wages. There's a high level of involvement all across the city with volunteers pitching in to transform green spaces. And then during the school year, we focus on what we call our green skills program, which is tree planting. And we have a partnership with the city of New Haven in which they hire us to plant the street trees. Many of these organizations work to provide more than just employment. Lowering recidivism requires supporting an individual's full array of needs, physical, mental, social, and emotional, something the justice system is not properly equipped to do. Emerges helps you with IDs, birth certificates, social security card, license, uh, uh, OSHA there, 10. a lot of difficulties surrounding? Um, yes, if yeah. you don't have your documents, you're in trouble. So they help you get everything you need. If you don't have whatever you need, they help you. Yeah. I would sort of summarizes as this is a place where housing is first, but we certainly believe that housing is more than bricks and mortar. So um, that means that we do things like a farm and create food access and inspire our residents to grow their own food and to also um, give them access to good food. Having access to housing and food is crucial to functioning in society, but these necessities are treated as privileges when they should be basic rights. When people are denied access to food or housing, their quality of life suffers. Reentry programs help to bridge the gap and give people the resources to not just get by, but to thrive. Yeah, I mean, it's expensive. Sometimes people face $2,000 fines, right? So if you're making $15 an hour or $16.50 or whatever, you're not going to be able to save $2,000 to get your driver's license. So driver's license, housing, and we've even provided support for, you know, food during COVID when people weren't getting their, their, their payments and were struggling. We would decide to give people money just for basic living needs. But when you come here, they assist you with understanding and they know because they've already been in your shoes, they already know what reentry is. So they assist you in getting ready for those things that are gonna come, which makes it easy. So my transition has been wonderful and it's been easy, easy, easy. When I tell you easy, I mean easy, so much support. She was able to take it just one step further and, and open, up, open it up to the community and say, not only do we want to provide support to folks that are being released from jail, but everybody in the community needs that. I wasn't attending school as much because uh, I was just out here in the real world. Uh, poverty is a, is a hell of a thing for me, so I had to get my money up, try to get jobs. Uh, my teacher, she really was there for me and helped me with that. And she's the one that actually brought this program to me. Yeah, Merge allows you to take the steps necessary 
to become comfortable in your new situation. Because it's one thing to be in prison, you you adjust to that way of being, that environment, but then you come here and it's like everything is thrust at you. Mm-hmm. You need this, you need that, you have to have this. And mm-hmm. that. We get to plant trees all around town and, and um, we're helping the environment while we're doing it, so it's mm-hmm. really fulfilling. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's cool to be able to go around town and say, yeah, I planted that. And mm-hmm. I, and that. I think the tree group by far stems out because I think it offers more of opportunity to get out in the community and make a living for yourself. So that's why I'm like interested into the program myself. This semester alone, we planted 400 trees and we're hoping um, to increase that number in the next five years. We actually just received a federal grant, um, an IRA grant from the Forest Service, the US Forest Service, to plant a thousand trees every year. So, the cool thing about that is with the funding that we've been, been getting right now, we plant everywhere in the city, which is fantastic. With this federal money, we'll be able to focus entirely in environmental justice neighborhoods. It is a small farm and that's typical of urban farms, but the impact doesn't have to be small. And I will say it is definitely not small. Most of my gratification or among my greatest gratification is when people walk by the farm and they say, what are you doing? And you know, they start asking one question after another and they say, can I do that? And I say, oh yeah, well you can just come here and we'll teach you. Many of these New England organizations have significant environmental contributions in addition to benefiting previously incarcerated individuals. So far we've planted, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but in my own <clears throat> personal opinion, I would say we planted at least 50 to a hundred trees all over the community, like my, the, the community I grew up in looks like completely different. And this is only for like within the last year. By fostering true connection to the community, these types of organizations challenge the status quo around reentry and climate activism. In doing so, these groups have found great success in transforming their surrounding environments, as well as the lives of the program participants. Society has its own sort of uh, force and um, power and we have to sometimes take an extra step to make sure that we are not being uh, complicit with what the dominant culture historically or whatever it is that is saying about different people in, your, in, in our communities. Putting more resources into these community-based reentry programs actively fights the racist and violent stereotypes cast upon currently and previously incarcerated individuals. But to work with these guys every day and understand that people are people, um, and people, you know, and, and some people are marginalized and, 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 you know, it's not like when you're a little kid, you say, I can't wait to grow up so I, I can go to jail. Like things went wrong. This is, and this is predominantly affecting black men, right? So, um, we're changing the narrative. Like I'm the type of person that, like I said, I like to be honest. I sold drugs in a lot of communities, right? So I didn't care about them. In my mind, I was up destroying them. Now I get a chance to what? Help rebuild them in certain, certain neighborhoods or different communities. Like this is my way of giving back. We can't ignore the fact that the United States justice system is set up to fail returning citizens. Justice associated individuals move through a dizzying number of official steps, but all of that ends at release. Reentry has become a patchwork of state programs, nonprofits and community organizations funded through private organizations or federal grants. Green reentry programs may seem like the solution to these problems, but their potential can't be utilized without greater recognition and expansion. Green reentry is a small part of a growing field. According to a recent study from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the need for green skills has increased by 8% per year over the last five years. The green job economy will continue to grow, creating more jobs that need trained workers to meet increasing demand. There's a crisis right now in trades. We don't have enough trained people to do the work that we have currently and that is coming down the pipeline. We're doing a lot of direct work and sort of trying to expand the green workforce um, or green infrastructure education within our neighborhood because there is a whole new sort of like line of job opportunities that will be available. Um, and we want to make sure that within our community, we're positioned to, to be within that job market. 
um, because we definitely have issues of, of unemployment and lack of access. As states implement more aggressive climate change adaptation policies, our economy will require more workers with green job training with the expectation that this field will only grow in the future. Reentry programs focused on green job training can help fill this need. We're very underfunded for a long time. Um, we started as volunteers. Um, however, we in the last couple years have received funding from the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. We're part of the Real Jobs Rhode Island um, partnerships and that has been a game changer for us. Even with these newfound funding sources, many reentry programs do not receive the support necessary to truly help their participants break the cycle of recidivism. In order to successfully reenter, they need employment, transportation, housing, healthcare, and mental health services just to get started. These issues and the programs that work to solve them need more attention. This type of recognition is critical to establishing reentry as an important political topic deserving of funding. To bring awareness to them is to bring awareness to the issues at their core and is a vital step towards lowering the impact of climate change and recidivism rates. I urge you all, uh, I urge everyone in Massachusetts to support this bill. It's the HERO bill, which is a bill that will make available about, about $600 million annually for purposes of building affordable housing and for mitigation of uh, cli the, the uh, climate change um, uh, consequences that we will are facing now and we will be increasingly facing. Another similar proposed bill, S-1733, would authorize grants to support community-based reentry resources for previously incarcerated individuals at a federal level. As of the start of 2024, the bill has been introduced and referred to committee. If members of the community bring more attention to federal bills such as this, green reentry programs can become more accessible across the country to those in need of a second start. Green reentry will not repair the justice system in America on its own. There must be open access and support on all levels, federal, state, and local. Environmentally focused reentry programs are only one aspect of the complex relationship between incarceration and environmental justice, but these programs give returning citizens real world skills and a sense of purpose in their community, while providing an avenue into a crucial field for our planet's future. With this green jobs and workforce development, there's, there can be some really like large scale change to bring jobs not just for folks who are like unemployed currently, not just for uh, folks who are in EJ communities who are, who are just not getting the same opportunities, but even like you know, people your age, like coming into a new economy where it'll be sur like it'll be based on climate change, an economy that's not one that we're used to. And so we want to set up everyone for a better future. These programs create stepping stones to something new. They help the environment regrow. They combat systemic injustices while reversing the effects of institutionalization. And most importantly, they give people hope. And with URI, I actually learned the different species of trees, the variations, like what to actually plant a tree and then come back and see it. Like he said, it's like, oh, we planted those trees. And in the environment that we live in, it's like to see these trees being added, it's like seeing a new life being started or given a chance to change. And now I feel like 20 years from now, some of the trees that I that I planted, I can't wait till they get to like this size and things like that. And it just puts a smile on my face. Again, I'm adding something to a community that needs something that offers, you know, hope, life, new life, new beginning, because these are new trees. So it's like I'm also coming back into my own life, so I'm gonna have a new beginning so I can see that tree sort of as myself starting to grow. And then I can watch it over time and see what it grows into and how you know it branches out, the many things that it adds to the places that they're in. They are real barriers and they are real challenges, but there are ways to navigate. And so being able to be part of a community that helps people navigate is really like paying it forward for me. So here you can come through our doors and you can feel like, okay, I'm understood, I'm accepted. There's certain things I don't have to explain. And that right there is healing in and of itself. I love my job. I love my city. You know what I'm saying? I get to help my city grow. 
And I get to work with people that come from what background I came from to help it grow. I love the community and the closeness, you know, like a little family. Cause some, a lot of people don't really don't have anybody. So this is only, this is, this is all they got. And I just like it. As a kid, this is a, you was bad. I don't be known for that. I don't be known for what I do now, making a difference. Well, the most rewarding part is knowing that I'm helping underserved communities and helping the planet. Everybody deserves a second chance. You know, that, like, like, I'm going I'm to keep saying that. Everybody deserves a second chance in life. Wow, 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 wow.